So I've had a decent amount of time working with development teams and working on developing an SDLC secured process for, for quite a while now, since uh, long before they were vendors that come out and say that they can do the same kind of thing. Uh, back when all our entire point was we were trying to keep the pipeline as clear as possible. Uh, but I came up with a process that I've been using for years now on this that I've had a great amount of luck and success doing. And the, uh, the guys here at FutureCon asked me to come in and, and share some of that wisdom with uh, the audience, as well as the strategies that I use to try to accomplish it. Uh, it's a, a little bit different because I'm not using any utilities um, other than some standard type utilities, which you, I'm not going to call out specific vendors. You can use whatever kind of code scanning vendor that you want for it. Uh, but you do need something along those lines in order to get the actual data in order to get them moving through the process. Uh, but other than that, it's just all process driven. It's all relationship driven and it's all set up in order to support the development process while keeping those security vulnerabilities that show up on the other end of it at a minimum. So the challenges. The only way that you're going to effectively be able to get this done is with either some miracle utility, which every vendor out there is going to tell you they can sell you, or by shifting left, if you want to use the, uh, po the popular vernacular for it. Uh, but more than just shifting left, you basically have to teach secure coding to your coding groups. And that's very difficult to do. Um, potentially, because there isn't really a knowledge there, there's a lack of interest, there's a lack of expertise. Uh, those particular people don't really care so much about that because it doesn't fit with what they're, for lack of a better term, graded on, on a regular basis. So part of the psychology there is that you need to change the paradigm of that. And you need to make it so that it is something that they're graded on, at least tertiarily, uh, even if it's not directly what they're graded on. Uh, the other problem is a need for accelerated timelines. That's because they're trying to crank these out. I know the organizations I work at, they're trying to do 20 plus releases a month. Uh, they're trying to do micro releases. They're trying to create this environment where they can respond to the customer as much as possible. And in order to do that, you have to have accelerated timelines and you have to make sure that these developers are actually programming with security in mind as they're going forward. And then you also can't be perceived as a roadblock. Uh, any ability that they have to perceive you as a roadblock or any idea that you could possibly is going to throw the entire thing off. The main thing here that you're really looking to do is you have to have developed the relationships and the trust with the leadership of these organizations that they know you're on board. They know that you're working with the company, that you have the same goals as the organization, that you're moving forward with the organization to accomplish what they need done. In other words, you fully understand the business goals. You fully understand the direction of the company and you have buy-in from all of leadership that you do know that. This plays into a larger problem that can come out from a CISO group sometime that I won't get into because it's not the purpose of this particular conversation, but you have to have that business knowledge and develop those business relationships so that trust exists there to begin with. Otherwise, they're not gonna trust you and they're gonna try to get around you. And a good part of that stems from emotional intelligence and relationship building skills. And a good part of that stems from business knowledge. Uh, that's part of the reason why I have the degrees and things that I do is because I needed to have that knowledge. Uh, my MBA does more for me at a senior executive level than any security certification I could ever have. And not just in its existence, but in knowing how to talk with them appropriately and communicate. And that's part of how you build that trust. And you get them to know that you are on their side and that you are looking out for the best interest of the company. You just might have a slightly different perspective than them. So let's look at the structure of a persistent team. So this is generally very vague, very uh, generalized, but a dev team or a persistent team at your organization. Uh, you have your scrum master and you have your coders and your developers. They don't particularly understand the security aspects. They're not really trying to do them. It's, it's not what they were trained at. It's not what they were doing. And the scrum master is concerned with their timelines and making sure that they're meeting all the features that are supposed to be released. Your goal or your team's goal when you come into this is to identify at least one person on that team 
to become the security champion or the extension of security onto that team. Now, if you had plenty of staffing, plenty of money, and you could put a security person on that team who somewhat understood coding at least, you could accomplish the same goal. You'd have a lot more staffing, it would cost a lot more money, and you'd have a lot more issues with perceived roadblocks with those kinds of scenarios. <laughs> so by far the better solution is to put a security champion on the team. The issue that you run into there, and we'll get into the structure and things on how you handle that in a little bit later, but the issue that you run into most often is somebody says, or you talk to management and they're like, we need a security champion on that team. All right, so what should we do? They make the scrum master the security champion. This is not the best of ideas. Uh, so the Scrum Master has a lot on their plate. They're there to block anybody coming in to talk to the rest of the team, to keep them on task, to keep them doing what they need to do to a program at an efficient rate. Uh, they're the face for that team. And they're also responsible for the timelines of that team. If you make them solely in charge of the security or the security champion for that team, that basically means as a security champion, they're supposed to be running the scans on that code. They're supposed to be performing the security activities, things that they're not going to have the time to do. They also have to have the time in order to be able to talk with your security teams, to talk with your people about questions or different things along those lines and that nature to get the security program moving forward, something they're not going to be able to do because of the time frames that are involved. So what should we do with this particular scenario? Well, we make the security champion someone else who's on that team. This is where some of the relationships start to come into play and where the having those relationship skills, that business knowledge really helps. You have to have a knowledge of the people that are on that team and find somebody on every team that has at least an interest or somewhat of an experience with insecurity. It doesn't have to be much. In fact, it could be nothing. Maybe they just really like the hacker scenes on CSI doesn't really matter as long as they have at least a little bit of an interest in it. And then from there, you nominate them as a security champion. There can be some jockeying associated here. Uh, I know for my current organization, we've run up to 21 different persistent teams at any given time. So I have 21 security champions. I don't want of those 21 security champions, eight of them to be on the same persistent team. So I do have to work with management of those teams to make sure that the security champions we've already identified are evenly distributed because they are going to be more of an exception to the rule as far as programmers for what they want to do. From there, my teams will train them. We'll, we set up regular training for them. Normally it's a one week induction process to show them what's going on one hour a day, five days a week, one week, to show them how the scans work, what they're looking for, um, what the OWASP top 10 is, how it plays in, what the importance of the work that they're doing is. All of these kinds of things, not necessarily teaching them the specifics of it, but teaching them why it matters, making them a champion for the cause, making them understand, okay, so we're going into this, we have a good idea of what we need to do, what we're protecting against, what common issues are that are out there, and why it's important that I have this function on this team. And that's how, I hate using the term, but that's basically how you shift left in order to bring them onto the team. From there, regular updates. So you, once a quarter, do another one or two hours worth of stuff to going on to keep them up to date about the newest stuff that's out there new security with different code changes because the, they're going to change their programming languages on a fairly regular basis too. And then be available. For me, I have a staff of two people that are available 24 seven for all the security champions at the company that answer questions. When they run these scans, when they run into something weird, when something doesn't make sense to them, my teams are available to answer questions to explain it, to tell them what's happening. And in the beginning, it happens a lot. As time goes on, it happens less and less. So why the security champion not being the scrum master? The scrum master is responsible for making sure that the delivery of the programs are done on a timely basis. 
the security champion is responsible for security and reports directly to the scrum master. They just report tertiarily to us for question answering. They don't even really report to us. The company has, this falls on the relationship set, the company has restrictions on what can be released as far as levels of vulnerability within code without specifically going through an exception review process. They're not going to want to do the exception review process because in essence, it comes out to being a delay. Even if that delay is a day, that can be the end of it for a team that's trying to do 30 releases in a month. So they're going to make sure that they're following that process and they're not having to go through an exception as much as possible because time is what's most important to them and is what they're graded on the most. So now I have the security champion who's responsible for making sure security is where it's supposed to be according to the policy that's been worked out for the company. And I have the scrum master already still responsible for it as well because that scrum master is responsible for those timelines. The security champion reports to the scrum master. The scrum master is supposed to be making sure everyone on his team, including the security champion, are doing what they're supposed to be doing in a timely manner. So now we've in essence put two security champion equivalents on that team without having to train the scrum master to do anything. You just get them as a champion to make sure things are being done and that things are meeting acceptable levels. Now, the next problem that comes in is what if you have somebody who either maliciously or ignorantly or not really realizing it starts deciding that they want to cut corners, that the security champion messes up or doesn't want to do their job or, or says that they're doing it without actually doing it. And the scrum master is not really following up and they're just passing it through. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be malicious, can very easily not be. But those circumstances happen, especially when there's no accountability. <coughs> Excuse me. Give me one second. So what we do is the two people who are on my team, full-time security staff, will do spot checks on a regular basis of everything going on in the development process. So we will go in and we'll run some of the scans as a spot check. We'll go in and we'll review the logs and things of that nature as a spot check on the different uh, development teams that are working. This oversight creates this dynamic where at any given time we could be checking up on them and puts a little more emphasis on the idea that it does need to be followed up on, that we do need to make sure that we're watching them and that we make sure that the process is being followed. Now, you can't be too heavy handed with it. You can't be malicious with it in any way because you can start to affect that business relationship piece that we were referring to earlier. But the simple existence of it creates additional pressure on making sure that the system stays in place. And that's what we're looking to accomplish. Uh, there's also auditability functions depending on the industry that you're in on showing that you're putting the proper, appropriate effort necessary towards security programs. We need to always train them, which we referred to earlier, and we're always available to answer those questions. Uh, the other thing that we like to do in these scenarios is we keep metrics of the ones that got away, of the misses, of the times that something comes in as having security vulnerabilities. We gamify it. We, in our instance, have these eight persistent teams that run right now on staff and we track it and we display it and we make it available and we can show both their progress and where they are in order to show the development teams against each other. So if security champion A is running a team and they accidentally release certain vulnerabilities, it's tracked and they, in comparison to the other teams, are lower on the list. Or if they even find and remediate vulnerabilities, if they only find and remediate five and still have a clean at the end versus Scrum Master B who has to find and remediate 10, then have a, a clean scan on the end. It shows to them in a somewhat competitive way because of the way that it's displayed that they are getting better, uh, that they're the best team, that they have the best skills, uh, things that create that competitive spirit within a lot of the development staff that's already there, 
because most of them do have this mentality that they can do it better. And it gives them something that they can show that allows them to do it better. Uh, the other activity that we do is we create a security champions oversight committee. So we'll take the security champions on staff. Uh, since we only have eight currently, it would be all of them. And my team will host them once a quarter for training, celebration, comparative of the results that happen, and to open things up for question feedback and whatever else needs to be accomplished. Uh, it's an event. We spend an hour doing it, followed by a little bit of a social event afterwards. It creates camaraderie around the security champions, even though they may be on different persistent teams. And it creates an air of the program where you have more of a desire for people to want to be security champions. It, it becomes a, a group, something people can get into a group where people can come and congregate and show this competitive landscape. We can then show the competition between them as it's going out towards other organizations uh, or other departments within the company or anywhere else that we have the access to doing. And we can post those scores into whatever communication or collaboration app that you have running. We can show this and create this community going forward. And that's really what you need to do in order to have an effective process without having crazy, almost oppressive controls that are out there, which can come from other particular options for accomplishing the same goal. The main thing that you need to watch out for and the main thing that you need to make sure you're accommodating for, <clears throat> you don't want to ever be viewed as being overbearing. You don't want to ever be viewed as being a roadblock, and you don't want to ever be viewed as putting security ahead of anything going on in the company. You have to be viewed as a partner. You have to be viewed as a trusted advisor that understands the circumstances that are happening. And that extension, because of the way this kind of setup is designed, doesn't limit itself to being just with you. It's extended to the rest of your security team, because your security team is going to be, or at least the ones assigned to uh, DevSec, is going to be responsible for the normal day-to-day -day interactions with the security champions that you have across this staff. So while this isn't necessarily what you would normally view as security controls within these areas, this is a more social way a more emotional intelligence or business intelligence way of creating a lot of those same synergies that you would see in more advanced utilities without being heavy handed. And it works wonders once you get it in place because there's no delay in those release schedules. You'll see the numbers drastically drop with security vulnerabilities that are being released. And it, produces fruit in abundance because you put the time and effort in to make it happen. Now, no short order, it does take a lot to make it happen. You're talking months of getting things straightened out and getting things organized and getting things straightened and building those relationships because you have to have them. This plays a lot into some of the leadership type relationships that you also need to have to be successful in a CISO role, but it's one of the few areas within information security where I also need to make sure I'm projecting those down into my staff as well. And that my staff is coming along and is working with those. So it creates a great mentorship opportunity as well for anyone that you have on staff that wants to go into leadership because those skills are ultimately what's going to be necessary and what's going to completely make them successful as they move forward with their careers. It's not an easy job. It, it becomes very difficult very quickly, but it pays off in dividends in multiple ways. You just have to get everything together and get it all straightened out. And I talked a whole lot faster than I was expecting to. And I skipped a couple stories in my notes. I probably shouldn't have thinking that we lost time with the technical difficulties. So I'm ready to go to questions 20 minutes early, uh, but 
I'm more than happy to tell stories about how I've been successful doing this if we don't want to ask any questions or figure anything out like that on the call. I do have some people. Mike said, um, do you see shifting left as a clear and easy path showing how this methodology is actually good for the bottom line of a company? Is it a good way to ensure budget for security? There's our first question. Okay, so it is an extremely good way to ensure budget for security. And it is very much a good path. I would not call it an easy path. Uh, there is a lot of things that you need to do to make it work. The easiest translation that I could say to it is, is, secure, is having a good security culture good for the bottom line of a company? It is, but it's very difficult to get that culture to change and to get to where it is. So you need to be able to come in with, a, if you haven't done it ever before, you need to either have already established the relationships necessary in order to make it work, or you need to bring in somebody with a clean slate in order to make it work. Otherwise, you're going to be dealing with such a emotional intelligence backlog of trust and hurt feelings in these kinds of scenarios that it'd be very difficult to actually accomplish it. There is no easy way or way to sugarcoat this. You are changing culture. They're not used to the idea most of the time of security working with them in a cooperative oversight capacity, which is basically what you're doing. They're going to be a lot more used to thinking of security coming in after the fact and telling them everything that they have that's wrong and making them go back and redo things or them saying, well, we're just gonna accept the risk of that now because it's already out there. And you have to change that attitude. Once you do, it's very much beneficial to the bottom line because you don't have those scenarios that come up or they come up significantly more rarely. If you have a major vulnerability in an app or in some kind of a development process that causes you to have to shut it down or that causes you to have to do an update or that causes you to do all of these things that can create a ton of work, a good amount of downtime, any ability to avoid that is going to be beneficial. And that's where the whole shifting left concept and idea comes from. But you want to be able to do it while maintaining all of those relationships on the team. And, and that's where the strategy that I'm putting forward comes from and works with, as well as coming from a place where I don't want to have the amount of staffing necessary to effectively do it with just security. So I have one of the greatest things about you finishing early is we can have our audience interact with us. And we really love your <laughs> questions because we know you guys are out there and we wish you were in the audience and we could see you live. But Darren did elaborate on his question and he said, change is very hard for some people. And hold on. And, and sorry about that, my... Uh, let me go back to change is very hard for some people and even harder for some departments. So what would your advice be on that? Change is very hard for people when you don't have trust and when they don't think that the change will make things easier for them. That, that's when you're going to get the most pushback. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. If it's their perception, their perception is their reality. If they think what you're doing is going to make things hard for them, if they think what you're doing is going to make things even hard in the short term for them, they're going to be resistant to it. And, and that's where a lot of that resistance from change comes to or comes from. And that's where that trust piece comes in. You, you have to have trust from leadership first, that you have the best interests of the company in mind that you are moving towards the objectives of the company, that you're on the team, you're, you're working for the organization, and that you have the best goals of the organization in mind. Once you have that, then you need to sell that this process will make things easier for the development teams. They'll interact with security less. They'll hit security roadblocks less. They'll come up with emergency patches because something happened less. It will make them more effective in what they're doing and allow them to concentrate more on innovative programming, which is what they all want to do. 
they all want to be the next person to write the next couple lines of code that have never been written before that are revolutionary. And the stuff that you're doing in security holds them back from that, or they at least perceive it as being that way. So anything that you're doing in this area that you can sell as making it easier for them, that pulls the security teams out of it more because they're going to think that you have no idea what they're doing, what they do on a daily basis or how any of their jobs function. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. That, that's going to be where they're coming from initially. And you have to be able to communicate to them and they have to believe that this will make things easier. And once you've done that, you won't hit nearly as much resistance on actually getting it put into place. Uh, then the only thing that's left that's difficult is identifying people that would like to be those security champion type positions. Well, we have many keynote speakers on our events that just talk about the challenges of just management and trying to work with your teams. Do you feel like, um, does Allegiant Airlines, do you have like a business CISO or do you just have one CISO? Does that help when you have that? Um, well, I'm the only CISO, <laughs> um, but in many ways, I guess I would consider myself a business CISO uh, just because I do have a lot of business knowledge. A, a lot of it comes from that MBA and yeah. having a, a good interest in the business. When I started here, I, I knew that the business relationships were important. I didn't make any changes. I talked very briefly with security people. I spent the first month getting to know the entirety of the executive staff how they work with the business, understanding the business, the business model, how it makes money, how the whole operation works, much more similar to somebody starting in a, a COO role than a CISO role, so that I understood. It also gave me the opportunity at the same time to ask them, how has security impacted you? What are the, the biggest pain points you have with security? When I didn't have a good idea even what security was for that organization yet. So I couldn't be colored and I could get what their input was, put it all together, get a really good picture, and then dive into the security aspects of the organization. Well, that's a great model to follow. And I mean, you guys have such a tough job. I, I Most people can't even wrap their head around what you guys are doing. But um, I have Rob said the staffing is a great topic. Is it, it's so difficult task to be able to build a team and a budget to adequately manage the risk. So how do you combat that? So the whole concept behind doing this, I hate saying shifting left, but that's what everybody says now. Uh, the whole concept behind doing this and behind shifting left is that you don't have the staff and you're not expected to get the staff that would be necessary to really ensure the security of the SDLC process. While not slowing it down. You could do it with fewer people, but you would slow it down. So the whole idea is to use some of the development team staff that's going to be there anyway, that want to be able to do their jobs effectively and accomplish it that way. Um, as far as actual security staff, if we're getting away from the topic of question, it all comes down to those business justifications. Um, you need to show from a business standpoint why you need the people, what they are going to do, what their day-to-day -day activities are, how they're benefiting or incorporated into what the company's mission is, and then you have to find them. If you're asking me how to find them, that's a completely different subject, which we could do an entire discussion on if you'd like. Uh, but the boil that down real quick, it all has to do with the reputation of your organization, the reputation of your security organization, uh, you as a CISO being able to attract them and your ability to train them and maintain them. And when I say maintain, I don't mean individual people. I mean maintaining consistent talent levels because really it should be your job to mentor and train them for whatever their next job is. And if that next job is with your company, that's great. But if it's not, that's great too. And as soon as you can get known as an organization where skilled talent can grow and develop and get to whatever its next level is, you won't have a problem so much finding talent. Well, that's a great answer. And I, 
Helen asked this question, and I think someone asked a similar question, what trends to be most frequent causes, vulnerabilities in development projects? I think we kind of had this similar um, question, but if you want to address that. Uh, the biggest one that I run into the most often is not validating their variable input. That That's more often than not, whenever anything comes up or whenever there's a problem, it becomes because they didn't validate their variable input. Um, and there's a lot of pushback on that because they don't understand why. So if you ask, if somebody's de developing something and it requires someone to put in an email address or a, a name, a first name or last name, they're not validating that it's only letters. They're not validating that it's a maximum size. They're not validating that it has an at something dot something and then ends. And this creates an opening for all kinds of different code injection type things. And most of the time when I run into something that's major or even minor that comes up, it has to do with that validating your variable inputs. So I actually do specific seminars for my development team about validating variable inputs and why it's important. And it knocks out a ton of stuff that's found both during the development process and after. If you can just get them to consistently and always validate that variable input. So Cheryl asks, uh, difficult to build staff when the number of qualified security can candidates is few and far between. That's where that developing that reputation becomes important. Uh, it also becomes important to create a pipeline for talent. Uh, we're way off subject, but I have no problem talking about it. Well, I mean, we have a few minutes left. I mean, that just yeah. seems to be such a, a big topic right now is there's just not enough security folks out there. So I guess it's pretty important to have a team that, you know, that you want to be, you kind of want to be the place that someone's going to want to come and work. Right. And it all has to do with growth. You, you have to have growth plans for your people that are on staff. And if you have growth plans for your people on staff, that means the people that you have are constantly moving up. And Unless you run into something where you're doing something new that's very complicated, you shouldn't really ever have a need to hire a very senior person. And it can occasionally happen, but it shouldn't really happen that often. That being the case, you're looking at backfilling with junior type levels as people grow and develop within the organization. And then those pipelines are significantly easier to develop through internship programs, through programs with the US military, there, there's all kinds of different programs you can look into for people that are moving into security that are starting at those junior levels, open to all kinds. I know the, the Women's Council does one for women in cybersecurity. Uh, the, I can't remember the term, but it's like uh, working with our heroes or something along those lines with uh, the U.S. military. Uh, some of those pro programs are very handy because the U.S. military will actually pay for them to come work for you for three months. And then if they turn out to be really good, they, they work well with you, you can bring them on to staff after that. And then there's your classic model with the internship program. You just need to make sure that unless you're a Microsoft or a Google or a name that everybody in the entire world knows, you're being realistic with it and you're not going to those major universities and you're going to universities that are, are local to your area because you're not going to be able to compete with a Microsoft or a Google that have dormitories set up for internship programs. You're, you're not going to get the best candidates. You're gonna end up with the bottom of the barrel if you try to commute or try to compete in those particular markets. So you wanna to go to your community colleges or your smaller universities or univer places you can partner your organization with for doing that kind of thing which also gives you then the option of having a regular rotating one or two positions at your company that are part of an internship program that are very low in wages that can do a lot of your more menial type tasks while simultaneously training them both to get them ready for whatever they're going after that and to see how well they do and how well they can grow in those areas to see if they'd be a good fit for your organization. The last thing you want to do if you develop that internship program is have them do nothing but grunt work 
and then have them leave and go out into the world and be like, man, I interned at that company and it was terrible. They had me do nothing but grunt work. I didn't learn nothing. But if you can develop that reputation for your organization outside of that, then you have a much better chance of grabbing a much larger portion of that limited talent pool that you're referring to. So we have questions that continue to come, which I love. I would always rather a keynote speaker speak about 40 minutes so we can interact with our attendees. I did have um, Helen say the program is called Hire Our Heroes, and it's a partnership between the Chamber of Commerce and the military. I yep. think that's really awesome. I am ex-military, so I love seeing those opportunities for our veterans. Um, Bradley said, are there any other tips, and you may have just done that, um, you have on building your relationship with the business? So I apologize for getting the name wrong. I wasn't expecting to talk about it here. <laughs> so I didn't have it in my notes to make sure it was right. Oh, you're fine. We're all good here. Yeah. So the easiest and simplest answer to what you asked is emotional intelligence and relationship building skills. You, this is an old saying. It's not an old saying. It's an old saying to me. It was told to me by someone early in my career. And I didn't particularly appreciate it at the time. In fact, I was really upset at the time when he told me. It was probably a good year, maybe year and a half after the fact that it really sunk in for me. It doesn't matter if everyone at the company thinks that you are the smartest person that ever existed in information security. Most of the executives at the organization, or at least the ones that really matter, have been there for a really, really long time. And they've seen this company grow. They've seen this company change. They've nurtured it. They've made it get to wherever it is. And they sort of view it the same way that you would view a child or your child. So it doesn't matter if they think you're a subject matter expert. They have to trust you enough that they would trust you to watch their own children, to trust you with where the company would go without trying to second guess you at every turn. And developing that trust, well, I mean, at the time I was writing white papers and I was speaking at conferences and I was doing all kinds of things. Uh, they told me point blank, no one here thinks that you're not a subject matter expert in your field. The problem is that trust. And I had, at that time in my career, I had never put any effort to developing that kind of trust with senior leadership. Uh, and that trust stems from business relationships, getting to know people on a personal level, on, on a level that's completely honest and you can't be fake about it. Insincerity is very easily spotted. Um, you can intentionally go about trying to do it, but then you also have to be earnestly trying to do it. Otherwise you're, you're not going to get very far. And once you've developed those relationships, you'll be surprised how easily it is to get some of those other things to move forward. It puts you into that trusted advisor type category and I mean, you can obviously lose it at some point if you do something really bad. Just don't do anything bad after you've developed it. It's kind of how it plays out. Well, this next question, and I can uh, I can appreciate this question. I've been a business owner for 20-something years, and it definitely comes with maturity, but it is valuing the staff is a direct connection to valuing the product being delivered. It's essential to have members know and understand that they are an important part of the complete picture from beginning to end. And it's easy to, to let that not happen, you know, because we all get busy, but you have to back up. And what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's even easier to let that happen now because of all the remote work. And everybody... Yeah just talking to each other on the phone, seeing each other on video. You need to go out of your way to make a concerted effort. And especially as the most senior leader at the organization within security, you have to go out of your way to make that effort. Um, right now, it gets even more difficult because of the social distancing. In the future, when the social distancing goes away and a lot of organizations stay work from home, it, there's going to become this need, this necessity in order to develop the relationship with your team, in order to make sure that they get to know you, that you they know that they're valued. You're going to have to start doing equivalency type, in my opinion, equivalency type events to things like the vendors do 
now to try to get all of the senior leaders into them with your staff. You have a, a whiskey tasting with your organization, depending on your organization, obviously, some people might not like that, uh, but some kind of equivalent within your own staff, just to get people together, just to get people talking. Uh, once you have social distancing gone, it's going to become more of a, you need to figure out a way to get everybody together on a, at least semi-annually basis, I would say, so that you can develop as a team like you normally would in an office even though you're not in that office anymore. And then from there, it's just open communication, making sure you go out of your way to give your staff time to ask questions and having the emotional intelligence and business relationships, relationship skills necessary so that they feel comfortable being honest with you. And it definitely has been a hard year, especially with no Christmas parties, you know, no having a lunch out, no happy hours, you know, so I think we're getting back to the, you know, we're finally starting to be able to do things. So, um, it, it, and I definitely, you can just see it on LinkedIn. There's been a, you see when you get notifications and people just got new jobs, there's a lot of turnover that I've seen in the past year, just with notifications. So yeah. Anybody that wants to do a group activity in Vegas, I'm sure they wouldn't mind. <laughs> I'm sure my team is cheering for that right now. So <laughs> we're, that's, you know, we're very happy that Black Hat is happening in Vegas. So looks like we're pretty much at our time. And that was great, Rob. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, probably LinkedIn. Okay. And um, Rob has a profile. If you go to the network lounge, you can see his profile. So if anyone has any questions, that will go straight to him. And thank you so much. Uh, Rob was in the middle of board meetings this week. So we really appreciate you honoring this spot for us because I understand how crazy board meetings are. So thanks for taking an hour and spending it with us. So thanks so much and um, love to have you back and hopefully live out in Vegas. So yeah. thanks, Rob. No, not a problem at all. It was a pleasure to be here.